up squad, it's your squid, aka the Anxious Squid, here at Anxious Squid Productions. You've landed on my channel for one of my history videos, which belongs in my history videos playlist, obviously. If this is the first time you've seen me, or you've seen my reaction videos, and this is the first time you've seen one of my history videos, stick around. I hope and think you might like it. Check out the whole playlist when the video is over as well. In a similar fashion to a previous video I did for this playlist about Bungaree, the Australian Aboriginal man who was the first Australian to circumnavigate Australia on Matthew Flinders' ship The Investigator, this video is going to be about Tupaya, the Tahitian high priest and navigator who was present on James Cook's ship The Endeavour. The Endeavour was the British ship that discovered New Zealand and the east coast of Australia back in the late 1700s, and you should check out that other video about Bungaree after this one if you haven't seen it yet. I'll uh, put a link up there or at the end of the video because I'm nice so you can watch it. Before we get into that too deeply though, I'm going to take a second to mention that these guys here are my patrons. They're pretty cool and you could be cool like them if you wanted to be. Patreon is a means of voluntarily supporting independent content creators that you enjoy on a monthly basis as if they were streaming services like Netflix or Hulu or Stan in Australia. As an American immigrant, I can tell you now that my patrons often help me to pay bills that I probably otherwise wouldn't be able to. So, due to shifting laws surrounding pending green card applicants, I'm, I'm not allowed to work at the moment, full disclosure, and the income I generate via these guys on Patreon is really beneficial for my family when you factor that in. Patrons of Anxious Squid Productions get a free sticker after their first month, access to the scripts for these history videos, guaranteed reactions to videos that they send me at certain tiers of membership, and a whole bunch of other stuff too. So click the link in the description after you're done here, watching this video about Tupaya, obviously, uh, and yeah, you'll get access to all of that, as well as add your name onto that list, you know? But let's actually get into the meat and bones of the video now, shall we? Get to the history of it. Tupaya and the Endeavour's trip through the Pacific. Full disclosure, I lent heavily upon an article written by Roz Blewett in April of this year for the ABC's National Radio Program, as well as a NASA Share the Science article written in May of 2004 without accredited author. They're both linked in the description if you would prefer to consume your media in that way. Now, let's get into it properly though, and I'll see you after the jingle. In October of 1769, the Maori of Aotearoa, which is the landmass now known as New Zealand, witnessed a strange sight on the horizon. It was an extraordinarily tall ship, high above the water, with tiny snippets of light shining from small squares along its body. White sails billowing in the wind, it had clearly sailed there from a vast distance. Word of this huge craft spread up and down the east coast of the islands before the endeavour ever even reached land. A leader in strange clothing, captaining a strange ship from a strange place, had arrived in their homeland. But the name of the leader they spoke of was not James Cook, despite what you might have been taught in high school in Australia. The name of the leader they spoke of on Aotearoa was Tupaya. Followers of this channel will know I don't like to dive into anything first without explaining the context though, so let's just stop and rewind a tiny bit for a second. We want that framework for how and why Tupaya was there with the British, right? So shall I explain? I shall. Measuring the size of the solar system Earth resides in was one of the chief scientific pursuits of the 18th century in Europe. In the time of Lieutenant James Cook, astronomers already knew that six planets orbited the Sun, and they knew the relative spacing of those planets as well. Of the planets we are now aware of, only Uranus and Neptune were yet to be discovered. And no, Pluto is not a planet, it's half as wide as America, if that, it's a glorified pebble, but I'm getting off track. Scientists in Cook's time knew roughly how big the solar system was. For instance, they knew that Jupiter is five times larger from the Sun, uh, five times further from the Sun, sorry, than Earth is. But the question at the time was how far is that distance in miles? The absolute distances and measurements were unknown to Europeans and people were curious. It turned out the planet Venus was the key to knowing more. Edmund Halley realised this in 1716, and yes, that's the Halley's Comet Halley, a pretty fascinating bloke all around who will definitely get his own video on my channel at some point, don't worry. Uh, as seen from Earth, Venus occasionally crosses the face of the Sun. It looks like a jet black disc slowly gliding across it, right? 
Ali reasoned that by noting the start and stop times of the transit from widely spaced locations on Earth, astronomers could calculate the distance to Venus using something called the Principles of Parallax. I'm not going to pretend for a second that I understand the mathematics of it all, or even what a bloody parallax is, but I'll take it on good faith that the rest of the world's experts have determined Halley was right in his hypothesis. Once observing the transit of Venus across the Sun, Halley thought the scale of the rest of the solar system would somehow follow through, through the magic of smart people doing math, I guess. And he was right. It did, eventually. In the 19th century, once we'd invented photography and adapted it to astronomical research, but I'm getting ahead of myself again. There was one huge factor in why it was such a long time after the events I'm talking about with Tupia and James Cook, and an even longer time after Edmund Halley's life had ended, that the measurements and his hypothesis could actually be tested. Transits of Venus across the Sun are unfortunately very rare. They come in pairs, eight years apart, separated by approximately 120 years. Edmund Halley would not be able to assess the transit of Venus in his lifetime, only postulate on what the outcomes might be in the mid to late 1700s if some were, someone were to do his math for him, right? An international team tried to time a Venus transit in the year 1761, but weather and other factors unfortunately spoiled the majority of their data. And that's where our mates Jimmy Cook and Tupia come in. Finally, I bet you were wondering when I would get back there. What, uh, what the 1761 astronomical failure meant, in short, was that if Cook and his crew failed to track the transit of Venus in 1769, every astronomer on Earth would be dead before the next opportunity came in 1874. Spoiler alert, they were only sort of able to track the transit and the mission ultimately failed. I'll explain that one in a second though too. On August the 12th, 1768, His Majesty's ship, the Endeavour, slipped out of the harbour, Lieutenant James Cook in command, bound for Tahiti with a view to observe the transit of Venus. The island of Tahiti had been discovered by Europeans only a year before in the South Pacific, and it, it was part of an Earth, it was part of Earth, it was a part of Earth, so poorly explored by colonisers that map makers couldn't even agree if there was a giant continent somewhere down there or not. It had long been fabled that there must have been a continent big enough to rival Europe in the south effectively for balance, but it had never been confirmed physically. Cook might as well have been going to the moon or Mars for all the unknowns he would experience. He would have to, he would have to steer across thousands of miles of open ocean with nothing like GPS or even a good wristwatch to keep time for navigation, and all in an attempt to find a speck of land that is realistically only 20 miles across amongst tens of thousands of miles of open water. On the way, dangerous storms could, and did, materialise without warning. Unknown life forms were waiting in the ocean waters below, should anyone be sent overboard, and it was for these reasons and more that James Cook fully expected at least half of his crew to penish, perish on the journey. And he prepared accordingly. Regardless, their mission was to reach Tahiti before June of 1769, establish themselves among the islanders, and construct an astronomical observatory. Cook and his crew would observe Venus gliding across the face of the sun, and by doing so, hopefully, measure the size of the solar system. Or, so hoped the England's Royal Academy, anyway, which had sponsored the trip based on Edmund Halley's old notes from the century prior. They arrived in Tahiti on April 13th, 1769. On June 3rd of the same year, they sort of observed the transit. And by sort of, I mean, they did see the black blobs smear across the sun like they were expecting. However, and in his own words, James Cook said, We very distinctly saw an atmosphere or dusky shade round the body of the planet, which very much disturbed the times. We know in the modern era that intense sunlight filtering through Venus's atmosphere would have fuzzed the edge of the apparent disk shape of the planet and therefore it decreased the precision with which Cook and others could time the transit. For this reason, Cook's measurements disagreed with those of the ship's astronomer, Charles Green, who observed the transit while literally standing next to Cook, standing right beside him. Uh, and they differed by as much as 42 seconds. Their observations were effectively useless, and the mission had failed as a result. Cook wouldn't dwell on these matters, though. There was a lot more exploring to do as far as he was concerned. Secret orders from the Navy instructed him to leave the island when the transit was done, and search for a continent or land of great extent. Two months after the failed astronomical observation, 
Lieutenant James Cook unrolled his special orders to sail south in search of the great southern continent, Terra Australis, which is Latin for southern land. Alongside his crew of talented English scientists now though, was Tupaya, a Polynesian high priest and wayfarer, or navigator as you might know it. Botanist Joseph Banks had secured their place on the ship. Yes, the Banks that the Banksia flower is named after. During the endeavour's four month stay on Tahiti, Banks, fascinated by island culture and ceremonies, had developed a strong friendship with Tupaya. I'll have a video about Joseph Banks like I had on William Dawes within a few weeks. I, I think he was a good bloke among, uh, amongst assholes, but I digress. Uh, hit the subscribe button and the bell to be notified when that goes up. When it was time to depart Tahiti, Banks convinced Cook that Tupaya's knowledge of the surrounding islands and his authority amongst his people would be helpful to the voyage. As a sweetener, he even offered to pay for the Polynesian's board on the boat and shared his cabin with him. Cook had not seen Tupaya's navigational skills firsthand, though virtually as soon as they departed Tahiti on August 9th, 1769, he let the Polynesian pilot the ship through what we now call the Society Islands. According to all the journals we still have access to from crew members, Tupaya knew the islands very well. He knew the depth of the water, where the reefs were, as well as how to avoid plenty of other potential calamities like unfriendly or hostile islands along the way. Now, let's just quickly hold up a minute to take stock, okay? Because the Endeavour was the only, the one and only, ship that Cook had on this voyage of hopeful so-called discovery, and allowing a local person he'd literally only just met to pilot the ship was an absolutely ballsy decision, and one has to admit that regardless of what they think about James Cook on the whole, I think. It showed a huge amount of trust between Cook and Tupaya, as well as showing Cook's faith in the navigational abilities of a non-British subject. Say what you like about the colonial terrorism, and it was that, Cook inflicted upon the Pacific in the following years, this relationship and the trust he gave Tupaya show that he knew that people he was helping to subjugate were competent, educated, and perhaps even more sophisticated in ways that the British may not have been in that part of the world. James Cook knew these things, and we know that he knew because he deferred to Tupaya's wisdom at length, and both Cook and Joseph Banks wrote about Tupaya's expertise extensively in their very own journals. I don't know about you, but I think ultimately that makes Captain Cook's crimes against humanity even worse, all things considered. We know he couldn't claim ignorance now, but once again, I've derailed myself and gone way off the tracks. The crew of the Endeavour needed supplies on their voyage and Tupaya paved the way to their success numerous times. He introduced the English to local chiefs on Aotearoa, Aotearoa, Aotearoa and took the officers through ceremonies that allowed them to arrive safely on each of the islands. Reciprocal gift giving being of significant importance, the hubris of the British would have seen them arrive on Maori land without anything to give the tribes they had met if it were not for Tupaya. Following a squiggle on a chart by, done by Abel Tasman in 1642, the Endeavour arrived in Aotearoa at dawn at Poverty Bay, which is now called Gisborne. The English thought they'd reached the unknown southern continent, not realising this was yet another Polynesian island. They didn't understand the local people nor their protocols for dealing with strangers. On the first day, Tupaya stayed on the ship, and sadly, a young Maori chief was shot dead by the British. Tupaya accompanied the crew ashore the next day. He was able to understand the local Maori people, and they him, because a lot of the Eastern Polynesian languages are intrinsically related, sort of like the Romance languages of Western Europe are, um, if that helps you understand what I mean. The foresight of Banks to have Tupaya come on the journey would prove to be unfathomably influential from that point forward. Despite the improved communication, there were still hostilities though. Sadly, more Maori were shot and killed during the process of first contact. It's clear that the Maori believed the ship belonged to Tupaya, regardless. He was a high priest, a navigator from his homeland, and he could say what he liked about his European companions to the Maori without consequence. Word spread up and down the coast faster than the ship could. Inquisitive locals came out to see the endeavour, and everywhere they went, Tupaya heard people calling his name, not Cook's. His ability to communicate with Maori reinforced his status and his skills as a cultural broker, and it paid off in a huge way for the British. Botanist Joseph Banks wrote in his journal, we never expected him to have so much influence. Auckland Museum's Carvey Chetty says, the endeavour crew needed food, water and safe harbour and all of that had to be done through deals with the Maori. 
The argument's been made multiple times that Cook never would have made it to Australia if it wasn't for Tupaya in New Zealand, Mr Chetty says. The entire story of James Cook's journey may have gone belly up very quickly with the Maori if it were not for Tupaya's presence. Think about how Jimmy Cook did in Hawaii, for example. In March of 1770, Cook gave up hope of finding the great southern continent and set sail for the east coast of what we now know as Australia. Not realising, of course, that those two things were the same thing. When they arrived in Australia a month later, it was a completely different culture and landscape for all on board, including Tupaya. Tupaya tried multiple times, but sadly could not communicate with any of the indigenous people in Australia. They found him just as strange as they had found the Europeans. His role of being the cultural mediator, the translator, and the diplomat for the HMS Endeavour was no more. His status on board the ship was marginalised as a result. As they travelled up Australia's coastline, he fell, in, he fell ill with scurvy. Cook claimed the eastern portion of the Australian continent for the British Crown, naming it New South Wales. Then they sailed north to Batavia, which is now called Jakarta in Indonesia. Intrigued by the streets, houses and people, Tupaya spent much of his time outdoors, but unfortunately the city in Batavia had open sewers and subsequently was riddled with diseases that, had, that he had little to no immunity to. This meant that nearly all of the Endeavour crew got sick, actually, including Joseph Banks and Tupaya. Despite eating fresh fruit and healing from the initial case of scurvy that he'd copped on the east coast of Australia, Tupaya died in Indonesia due to disease. Cook and Banks returned home to Britain and were hailed as heroes, but Tupaya and his work were overlooked and then mostly forgotten about by the Western world. It was there in the original logs and journals the whole time, but for 250 or so years, Tupaya was a forgotten figure in Australian folklore, despite the absolutely pivotal role that he played in the voyage of so-called discovery. I hope this video has changed that for you, and that moving forward, you'll remember Tupaya for the significant he role for the significant role he played in the birth of both New Zealand and Australia as we know them. That's the end of this video, though, folks. So. Do me a favour and share it with your friends if you enjoyed it or found it informative. Do me a massive favour and hit that subscribe button, smash that like button if you can as well, and maybe join in with these guys in giving me some money on a monthly basis, that'd be dope. They're my patrons, I told you at the start of the video, the links to that and other stuff like beard grooming affiliates are in the description. Check it out if you're so inclined. Uh, comment what type of history video you want me to get to next um, for this playlist, obviously, and I'll see you when I look at your squad. You'll see me when you look at me. Thanks for watching.